When I began writing this testament, it was as if someone else was saying it for me. Today, everyone is in danger, both Lebanese and those who have settled and live here in Lebanon. I am one of them, and I can see myself being abducted and my life taken from me as I make my way on the road that leads to my home village of Naba. If that feeling becomes reality, I would like these words, addressed to my family, to the inhabitants of my village, and my country, to remain once I am no more. I can see your face, Hasibi. You are smiling, radiant and happy. Having reached the tender age of 11, you have to leave your beloved family and your quiet village of Nabha in the Lebanese hills. You find yourself in Beirut, where to help support those close to you, you are employed as a carpenter's apprentice Feelings of loneliness and suffering overwhelm you. Was it not then that you repeated, we Christians should know how to transform suffering into joy, for only then will we be worthy to carry the name of the chosen ones of the heavenly master. Did not these words contain the secret of your unceasing joy of life? We knew him a long time. He was of God. He always had such a wonderful sense of humor. His face was radiant, full of love. He always endowed us children with a motherly and fatherly love at one and the same time. That is how we knew him and how we remember him. He spread joy in our homes. As soon as he opened his car door, we used to run and surround him in a circle, for we were children then. He brought great joy whenever he came, a joy that filled our homes and our whole village. I honestly have to say that with his death, that joy was extinguished. Yet I am convinced that our uncle is listening to us now, from up there in heaven, and that he is happy that he can see us here. He loved us then, as we love him now. Now, and we believe that one day we will all meet him in heaven. When I was a child, my parents told me about you and about your love for me. My mother taught me to pray. My day belongs to you, Lord, who gives to each of us according to our needs. Every day I prayed this prayer, while in the evening, Lord, I commend my spirit into your hands. I did this with the simplicity of a child and I would hear my parents as they said, Our Father, who art in heaven. My spirit immediately absorbed those words, even though my mind could not fathom their meaning. I could see how my parents turned to you when faced with danger or in need, or in gratitude and in joy. They would always lean against you, whether in suffering or in joy, believing with the fullness of their faith that you were their one and only Savior. I heard and saw all this in our old home, so poor that it could not have been the envy of anyone. Indeed, in truth, it would have been impossible to find a home poorer than our own, perhaps with the exception of the stables in which you were born. And it was then that I understood how rich poor men's homes can be in you and with you, my Lord. <laughs> We always used to gather in this home. Joy, love, singing. You could find all of these here. Hasibi was proud of his poverty. He loved humble dwellings, for the Messiah was born in a manger. That is why he did not want to own palaces and would have been pleased to live in a home even more humble than this one. Whenever he met anyone on the street, he used to say, Come and visit us. We will have a bite to eat and talk. We left this house when Hasibi was killed 24 years ago. Every morning in this room, I would hear my father as he said, Praise God every nation. 
I would hear birds singing outside the window. Our home was beautiful and tidy. We grew up in such a home with parents who lived a humble life of prayer. They taught us how we should live, and that prepared Hasibi for his martyrdom. He was filled with true faith by my parents, and that in turn gave him the strength to give up his life as an offering. When you had lived through 17 summers, your father departed to the Lord. You had to return to the village to look after your mother and your sisters. You have no work, and you devote all your time to the children. You open their hearts to the truth of God, and that becomes your joy and your life. At that moment, the priest had decided that he had it was then that our bishop decided that our catechists should be paid, for they also have to live. So I proposed to Gassib that he receive training and join us on our rounds. At least that way he would earn something. He wasn't very keen at first, arguing that the word of God was not for sale and agreeing to teach for free, but he had to live and in due course he accepted our offer. Alors, au bout de quelques temps, il a quand même accepté d'être payé. It was a great pleasure watching him teach catechism. He used to drive with us to all 14 villages in which we taught. Children loved him. How he talked with the children and the ease with which he passed his faith on to them was something that had to be seen to be believed. He was very straightforward, while at the same time very deep. Father Nicholas arrived in the village one day to celebrate Mass. I led the choir then, and we had taken great care in our preparations, having repeated all the hymns that we were going to sing. Mass began, but I was late with the first bars by a few seconds. In response, Father Nicholas, who was well known for singing out of tune and was already standing by the altar, broke into song. After the service, I spoke to Gassib while I was tidying up. Father Nicholas really spoiled our best hymn, which we had spent so much time and effort learning. Gassib was quite a taken back by my comment. He looked at me and said, Do such things really upset you? Do you think that when your final hour comes, you will even remember this? Such things are of no consequence. Your calling to serve God began to grow and mature. Wanting to become a priest and servant of the Lord, you look for a seminary that would take you on. But it is not easy, for you are too poor and have no academic achievements to your name. But finally, the Jesuits of Tanail opened their door to you. He often went to pray in the chapel of Our Lady. He prayed to her and to Jesus. Sometimes he would stroll all the way to the pond, a large pond that is not 20 minutes distance from here, following this road. On the way he would devote himself to religious contemplation on the mysteries of the Gospel and meditate upon Jesus, upon God. I knew this young man, for he visited our home in Tanail. He was clearly someone who needed to pray. When you talked with him, you were under the impression that he had a calling. He also felt that the Lord was calling him, even though at that time,